Welcome to Executive Education in Sustainable Fashion. Today we're going to talk to Toby Usnick about ESG, which is driving Wall Street, and CSR in global companies and in local corporations. Welcome to the Executive Program in uh, Fashion Sustainability with my guest today, Toby Usnick. Hey, Toby, how are you? Hi, Simon. Great to be here. So, Toby, I want to start by bizarrely quoting something that I said 10 years ago. When I joined Parsons, I spent a while there, I was interviewed and they said, what's your big mission here? And I said, I want people to know about sustainability. I want sustainability to be so important to people that it's not a consideration, it's just part of their DNA. And at Parsons we could do that, we could teach students to really care about something, expose them to it, help them to understand it, so that it will become a natural part of their working life. How far are we away from that? Well, thanks to you in large part, I guess we've come a long way, Simon. I think that um, that is the reality we're moving into. I have uh, written a book, as you know, recently called The Caring Economy, and it's very much about a revolution that I think is happening real time. Uh, certainly with millennial consumers, uh, but also old fogies like me, who have been uh, around long enough and know a good thing when they see it, and also a charlatan when they see it. So what I'm seeing happening now is the investors, the employees. Well, let me just, oh, hold yeah, on, you mentioned sure. your book. Let me ask you first, why did you write a book? Well, I Tell wrote a book because I had something to say. <laughs> um, and uh, my background, as you were alluding to, uh, is in corporate communications, a large chunk of which has been dedicated to corporate social responsibility. And uh, it is my belief, as it was yours when you started at Parsons, that we've, we've got to do something here. We've got to scale this up. We've got to share the message. We've got to evangelize. And great leaders, I believe, in fashion as well as in business in general are doing that. So my book is meant to be sort of a primer, if you will, or a, a time-saving, money-saving way for those who are interested in CSR or those who have started to do it or want to do more of it uh, to just keep on, keep on doing it. And uh, I think you were right. This is where the world's headed. And if we can help for, through my book, through your program, through the work that you do, uh, I think then we're really helping to solve the problems that are facing the planet. So let's start with what does it look like? From a general perspective, what sure. does real CSR look like in a meaningful sense mm -hmm. for a company? Mm -hmm. It's always going to get back to the individual. Uh, I would say part of the reason I called my book The Caring Economy is because the impulse of caring is what's most important. I think sometimes the language throws people off. Is it corporate citizenship? Is it sustainability? Is it ESG? Uh, the most important thing is to follow that impulse to care a little bit more than just about transactions. And this is where I think you are ahead of the times because the consumer now is more connected, more informed, and more concerned about the challenges and the opportunities facing us. Well, you can't hide it anymore. You know, when we look at what's going on in the world, Absolutely. young people today, they can see global warming exists. They can see the damage that we're doing. They can see the damage that companies are doing. And companies can say what they like, but the evidence is right there in front of them. Absolutely. And the consumers are voting with their purchases. Similarly, the young employees are voting with where they, decide, where they decide to work. I don't know one HR professional today who has not seen a rise in the frequency of the question about what's the company's purpose or what's its give back, what's its CSR, mm -hmm. and perhaps in place uh, a diminishing of what are the benefits, the corporate you know, HR benefits that I get. It's funny because we, we did a conference that included this a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. Fashion Culture Design, and one of our speakers was from JP Morgan, mm -hmm. and she was in charge of uh, private banking, I think. And she, at one point, we got very passionate, she blurted out, I would never work for a company who I didn't believe in their values. And that's happening more and more. Absolutely. In fact, I write about Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan and the bank, and how from the top down he has infused and reminded employees about those values, those shared values. And he lives it and breathes it. And the employees there know it. They see it. This is not a, a mantra for them. Well, it's perhaps a mantra, but it's also something that he himself practices and everyone that I've interacted with and working at times with J.P. Morgan has been the real deal. I guess it's almost... In, well, I hope it's inevitable because to get to be the CEO of a wildly successful company, you've got to understand the future. 
you've got to have an eye, you've got to be a visionary. Mm -hmm. And if you are a visionary, you probably realize that sustainability is important. Mm -hmm. Let me go back a little bit. Sure. You hear a lot about CSR, which is what we're here to talk about, but also ESG. Correct. So, and they often get uh, conflated. Mm -hmm. Explain to us the difference between the two of them. Sure, in the simplest sense, I would say that CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, is the practice, the program, the commitment that a company makes to being more responsible. Um, ESG, and that can, that can be really basic, like using recycled paper, mm -hmm. you know, cutting down the waste, controlling their carbon, emi carbon emissions. Commitment to diversity and inclusion, or um, more transparency in the way, what they report and how they report. Because I think that, well, we'll come to ESG in a second, but I think that it's important for people to understand that it's not just about organic or recycling. You know, mm -hmm. it is inclusion. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a, a, ho a sort of holistic, caring, caring way yeah. of running the company. Mm -hmm. So the ESG is, uh, is uh, the measurement, basically, the environment, social, and governance. And it gets particularly exciting because ESG is a way in which publicly traded companies uh, report and can be compared in sort of an apples-to-apples -apples way. So this is the CSR is no longer what was once perhaps considered fringe or a nice thing to do or window dressing. When you have the Wall Streeters looking at it and measuring and comparing and reporting on it, this is where it's happening and where you know it's more than just a fringe practice. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that because I, I love, it's, it's terrible, right? I love it when companies ignore global warming <laughs> because I look at it and think, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? You look at, we were just talking about um, Larry Fink mm -hmm. having a very public, very pronounced Black position Rock, on yep. this. Yeah, mm -hmm. BlackRock, biggest investor in the world, biggest uh, asset, manager, asset yeah. management in the world. And they are like, if you're not addressing this, then I will unseat you. Mm -hmm. Which that mean, that literally means, if, they're a comp if you're a company that they're thinking of investing in and you don't believe in doing something about CSR, mm -hmm. they will get rid of you. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, well, I, I would say, uh, I, I, um, I have two takes on that. One is an entrepreneur is an individual who wants to develop business. I try to meet my clients or my wish list clients where they are on their CSR journey. If an individual or an organization is committed to becoming more responsible, more transparent, more inclusive, uh, lessen their environmental footprint, then I'm there to work with them. But they have to want to change and commit to it publicly. Um, that said, I think when you have BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, $7 trillion, I think, approximately, under management, their CEO, not just this year, but last year, set the tone by saying to all stakeholders, basically, we're putting you on notice. We want you to, we expect you to report on ESG because, because this is a fiduciary responsibility we have. That was a shot heard around the world. And why I also like it is because it sets a tone from the top down. It certainly causes conversation and debate, but it also happens that, in my view, be true. If companies are not thinking about this and acting on it, then they are not going to be around in another 10, 20 years. And in part, it's because they're perhaps putting their heads in the sand, but also because the recruits are not going to work for them or want to work That's for exactly them. it. The customers do not want to buy yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah. And the investors do not want to invest with them because they feel a higher calling or responsibility. So it's purpose and profit. And in Larry Fink's shareholder letter this or stakeholder letter this year, he said that very phrase that purpose and profit are inextricably linked. It's they amazing. It's, and, and this is, comes back to my perverse delight in seeing companies that refuse to acknowledge that. You know, it, it, for me, it always smacks of being the last guy in town still trying to sell leaded gasoline mm -hmm. when every single car in town runs on unleaded. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot at stake in people's minds, but that's your, that's enter you as the, the advisor and the person who can help coach and get well, people well, that's, to that But that's place. what this program is all about. Yeah. This program is all about helping executives who have success, successful companies to understand that one, sustainability is necessary for success. Mm -hmm. It's not an option anymore because the, 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 the consumers of tomorrow demand it. Indeed, the consumers of today, today demand absolutely. it. absolutely. But secondly, and this is what I want to come to next, you can be more successful. You can absolutely. make more profit Correct. by being sustainable. Yes. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how a company embarks on a pathway towards mm -hmm. sustainability. And no one's ever sustainable. We need to dismiss that one from day one. Yeah. But towards improving their sustainability, mm -hmm. to improving their CSR. Yeah. One company that I like that um, was kind of a great comeback story is Lego. We all grew up playing with Legos. And 
about I grew two up. Then. I still play with it. I've got two <laughs> kids. I play with it every day. Yeah. Well, you can't go to a Lego store anywhere in the world and not see droves of people coming to buy and collect and uh, I share. just read they had a great year again this year. Yeah. But a decade ago, it wasn't the case. About 2004, they were hovering on bankruptcy, and they took a decision to really reinvent and go back to their roots and look at children and play and make commitments to to uh, inclusion, to uh, sustainability. So for example, now I think there's something like 140 million Lego bricks, um, older bricks that have been recycled, repurposed into really? new bricks. Ah. Uh, there's probably about 50-50 parity now in women in leadership roles in, uh, in Lego. And uh, they haven't sold their soul and gone, for example, digital. Right, right. right. They're, they're committed well, I mean, to the act of play and analog physical interaction. That's true, although they have embraced the future, which, you know, sure. I mean, the Lego movies have, have had a massive impact on their business, which yes. is fantastic. Why yeah. not? That's okay. So you asked about the setting the, the path for uh, building a CSR program. So using that as an example, with CSR, the best cases that I've seen that I've been involved with, you have to build from your own DNA. So if you, if you bolt on something and say it's CSR, and an example I write about in the book is Ford uh, doing breast cancer uh, philanthropy. A noble cause, and they made huge important contributions, but I would submit that it's not a part of their DNA. Rather, it's more about, oh, women buy cars, so we'll, we'll invest in a cause that's important to them. Whereas I think of Ford as more of automation, movement of people, transportation, if they could do more around investing in tech and solutions that are yeah. celebrating that, that's more exciting. In fact, they are moving there and um, they've come a long way. Uh, and again, not to take away to what they've done with breast cancer. Uh, but then you take what's in your DNA and start to build from it. So Tencent, huge Chinese conglomerate, I think it's a $600 billion gaming company in its roots owns WeChat, the biggest communications mm. platform in China, as you know. Which we're uh, watching this on. Fantastic. Incidentally, at the WeChat. end of this, we'll be taking questions for Toby on WeChat. And I'm T. Usnick on WeChat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the point is, they have, with their platform and their clout, what they've done is, among the many things they've done with their CSR, is uh, create 9-9 Charity Day. September 9th is an auspicious date. And many people in the retail world, particularly in China, know 11-11, the uh, single day, day yeah. huge consumer, consuming day that's bigger than Black Friday. Huge doesn't even begin to describe it, does it? Correct. Yeah. Billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, but on 9, 9 Charity Day, they have inspired a generation of consumers to give back. So with their WeChat platform, you can make micro donations, you can donate products, you can share your moments, raise visibility. And that number, it's only, I think, three years old. They have been growing every year steadily in the give back that their customers and they are using mm. with their platform. Super exciting, that, that, super sophisticated. Yeah, that I find very inspiring because I'm tired of the old way of doing things. Right. You know, and I think pledge drives are great. Love it, love it, love Jerry it. Jerry Lewis telethon. The, yeah, I mean, you can't still do that, though. You know, you've well, you got, can, and they do. Red right. Nose Day, but I mean, you, there are Which is wonderful, <laughs> yeah. you know, but you've got to also embrace the future. Yeah. You know, I was talking to, uh, and we're, we're here, we're right now we're, we're actually sitting in JD's office. Great company. And I was talking to them CSR, about what they're yeah. doing, and it, you know, not a lot of people hear about it, but yes. I know you're an expert, or you've got some knowledge of what they're doing. Very well. I have a uh, family that work there, but uh, I actually have had the good fortune to sit at dinner with Richard Liu, the founder, and his wife Nancy um, in a very intimate six-person dinner. I've been with them on other occasions and I will tell you that going back to your question about how do you build and implement this program, um, the best way is when it starts at the top and works all the way through the organization and Richard Liu and Nancy is his spouse, they set the tone. They are very committed to education in particular and also giving back to the communities from which they've come or where, they, where JD works. So how that gets played out in the JD business model is quite thrilling vis-a-vis -vis CSR. You have, for example, um, they are sourcing something like, I think, three million different products on the JD platform. This is the largest e-commerce giant in China, largest retailer in China. Um, those three million products are coming from provincial parts of China so that they're sourcing there. And most people think of that part of China as consuming. But the fact that you can then take things from there and get it out into the marketplace is creating jobs, revenue, opportunities, mm, and yeah. elevating people. And Richard himself comes from a rural part of China. So I think that's a fantastic reflection of leadership, 
the leadership setting the tone. Right. And then they go on, there's 5,000 new electric vehicles coming into their fleet this year. I think they yeah. gather product, because one thing I learned is that they actually pick up product from consumers and Correct. take it back Recycled, to recycle it. Exactly, the clothes. Yeah. They've done away, not done away with, but they've completely revamped their packaging such that duct tape is not being used like it once was. 250 million meters of duct tape no longer being used. Yeah, they found new we've got to, to sort package. something out. In this country, we've got to sort something about the cardboard boxes yeah. that get use brand new every single one that ever arrives in my building is brand new yeah. I've never seen an, an anything other than a brand new cardboard box yeah. and maybe they're made from recycled paper I don't know but reusing them would be fantastic Correct. and and just building on that sort of future forward technology platform that JD offers they're doing drone deliveries already in China but they're also taking that drone technology and starting to experiment with disaster relief efforts so if you can't get a truck or a person yeah. in at least you can use that drone delivery system to get in medicine or urgently mm -hmm. needed things. So that's super exciting, and it's just one of many examples of what's happening out there. But it's so, got to go to back to your original question. Yeah, is you want to build it from within. You want it to reflect your DNA. You want it to play to your strengths and leverage it. So let's talk about what it is then, mm -hmm. because uh, we just talked about JD, massive company. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the ability to do very, very large, impactful things if they uh, mm -hmm. they've given the right direction. But let's talk about what smaller companies can do. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you start? on the road to CSR. And I, I, I take your point about sure. you meet them where they are, you st you, if they decide, all right, we're going to do something good, how do you start? Sure. What, what, have, what have you seen where companies have started and, and, and made a good uh, bit of progress? Yeah, well, I can speak from personal experience here. Um, I, but I would first state that the smaller companies actually have, in some ways, more opportunity for impact and differentiation because of that size. You're not behemoths that can't experiment or, or try things out and you can get immediate feedback more quickly from your, your stakeholders. So it's, it's an exciting thing to be a small company. And I've often said, and even written in my book, The Caring Economy, that having money is the least creative way to solving problems. It's great to have a budget, but it's, sometimes you get more creative solutions by not having so much money or so much staff. So the, what I would consider a small firm, and I built the CSR program there with my colleagues, was Christie's Auction House, big brand. Um, a luxury brand, but 2,000 employees uh, worldwide, so not huge. Um, I can give you some smaller examples as well, but at Christie's we were able to build Art and Soul, which was our CSR platform, right. adding a little bit more soul to the transactions around art. And we were able to get our employees out volunteering, taking underprivileged children to museums and demystifying, giving them permission to expose themselves to culture in a way that they wouldn't otherwise have done. We were uh, reducing our carbon footprint by just trying to do more recycling and um, just simple, simple awareness raising around how much waste we were generating. Um, and then I, I would think that asking the employees how they feel the company should respond as well is really helpful. Absolutely critical. I, I talk about a bullseye in my book, and the bullseye is any effort. Really, great brands are built from the inside out. My old boss, Catherine Mathis, used to say that at the New York Times Company. And it's true. So you start with the employees in the center. If you're going to build in a small company or a large company or a mid-size like Christie's, uh, if you want to build a CSR program, start to hypothesize and talk to your employees. Do it in small focus groups, walk the halls, right. and start to create a common definition of what CSR means to you and what it might look like. Try it on. Well, you need enthusiasm to drive it through, don't you? Because you can't simply decide and implement. That's not how it works. Correct. But I think the good news is that often it's the people on the ground who yeah. maybe are already doing it. Yes. But certainly they're the ones that are going to make it happen. Yes, and if you do this sort of, what I describe as sort of test driving or, or listening tour, you'll start to identify early on in defining what CSR might look like for your company. You'll start to, define, you'll start to identify early on your evangelists and the people who can be your, your soldiers in arm, even though they might be in sales or HR because you only have yourself or one or two staff members or volunteers or interns. Um, that is how you build your army. And as Dick Army used to say, a horrible quote, not my favorite person to quote, but he used to say, you go to war with the army you have. So build <coughs> your, build your, or Dick Cheney, I can't remember. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> the point is work with the strengths you have, find your allies and campaign and yeah. keep on iterating. Well, let, let's talk about what success looks like then. So yeah. talk, let's talk about fashion companies, because sure. this is about fashion and sustainability, sure. yep. that have made an impact and done something good, whether it's a small one or a very big sure. one. Sure. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. So I, I'm quite friendly with H&M. 
Yep. And they've got, you know, as far as fast fashion or mass fashion goes, they've got a fairly good approach, you know. Around it's recycling. Debatable, and, yeah, yeah, recycling. There was a Polyester. wonderful anecdote where um, we were talking about uh, female representation at the top. And if you go there, practically all the leadership seems to be women. Mm -hmm. And they, there's a story about the guy that founded it, who's the grandfather of the current uh, CEO. And they asked him, they said, what do you think about this? You know, we should be more inclusive. And he said, I, he didn't understand what they were talking about. And they're like, well, you know, people are saying we should hire more women. He said, I, I've only ever hired the best people. And I, I'm in a room full of women. So, mm -hmm. so what, what, what do you need me to do? <laughs> you know, I'm misquoting him horribly. But right. the point is that, you know, they, it was, he was blind to, to gender. And so he hired the smartest people. So that's one example. Yeah. Oh, so a couple more I would layer in there from fashion. Um, uh, Levi's and the way they've embraced uh, gun violence. This is the storied cowboy gene. The Wild Wild West is associated with guns and yet they have thrown themselves into the thick of a real profound social issue right now. Didn't need to, could have kept their heads down, but they went right into it. Similarly, mm -hmm. uh, Nike and social justice. God, that's and amazing. The Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Yeah, yeah. Um, and from where I sit, uh, you know, some could say it's a just a, a bold marketing move, and to some degree, they they will profit, and it may have been a marketing move. But I actually happen to believe that they do care about the, the well, subject. They, I, this may also. I mean, the trouble is, you can never quite know. But I remember hearing, uh, reading about that, and there was a debate within Nike as there is about everything. And apparently, it, Ka Colin Kaepernick was taken off the table. Mm -hmm. But then, when the leader of that team found out, they were furious and they demanded. Mm that that became front and center, yeah. you know, and I think... Well, and then at the end, uh, the shareholders and the consumers and the employees have voted, yeah. right? Yeah, and exactly. we have seen a, mm -hmm. a rise, in, in a sense, in their brand. Yeah. Um, but also with CSR and with Nike and these other brands, it's about iteration and campaign. It doesn't stop. You've got to keep on going. Yeah. And real leaders take their teams into those battles and hear them and pivot yeah. and grow with them. Yeah. Um, the granddaddy of all, who, uh, who we all know and and I have great respect for is Yvonne Chouinard in Patagonia. Right. And what I really like about the Patagonia um, model is twofold. One, you take your puffy coat and you repair it. And every duct tape or mm -hmm. repair is a, it's a badge of honor for a, a life well lived. Yeah, yeah. And we're in this experiential retail era where I think that is more important Do you know what it reminds ever. me of though? It's ironic that we think about this as futurist because my mother, used to work in a dry cleaners and she would repair shirts yeah. and she would turn the collars it was called in England so you wore your collar and it got worn out so she would take off the collar turn it around yeah. and put it back on because yeah. because she comes from the war generation yes. that had to, although I'm much much younger than that sounds but um where they had to they had to fix everything yes. they couldn't just dispose of stuff that was impossible yeah. so now we're trying to relearn what that generation already did well funny enough i'm writing an opinion piece right now for women's wear daily which i hope will be published they've asked me for it but it's uh it's basically it it sort of um i sort of channel thomas meyer of who was the yeah. designer of bottega, bottega. Veneta, and in uh, 2010 the new yorker did a beautiful profile on him and the title was have Le just have less Mm. Nike has just do it. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Meyer was just have less. And the, the point was have something, cherish it, steward it, and then when you're ready, you either repair it or you pass it along to someone. Like I joked at Christie's, we were the original recycler. It's true. We were 50 yeah, years yeah. old, yeah, yeah. high quality, cherish it. Yeah. But we've gone, we've gone too far in this consumption model. And I think that consuming and uh, conserving are opposite sides of the same coin. So going back to Yvonne Chouinard in Patagonia, they tried to inculcate this concept of being owners, not consumers. Own it, protect it, restore right, it, right. share it, cherish it, yeah. and then when you're ready, steward it on in the responsible way. So whether it's Yvonne Chouinard at Patagonia or Christie's, um, I like to joke that at Christie's we were doing we were doing what Maria Kondo does now. You, we all know the art <laughs> yeah, of tidying, yeah, yeah. Uh, bringing joy, sparking joy, mm -hmm. uh, by way ahead of our time. So these are not, as you said with your mom, these are not new ideas, but yeah. I think we need to be reminded of it. Well, and we use the times and what challenges are facing us to help educate and engage people around the solutions. Mm. I think it's heartening to see the, the uh, reselling sites and businesses that are growing like the Absolutely. real real, real, real. Yeah. wildly successful yeah. and it's second-hand goods mm -hmm. you know, when I, I used to live in Hong Kong and there was a store there which they said was for girlfriends to sell their handbags that, that boyfriends have bought them but it was I think it was called Paris station there was a Milan station but it was the, you know one of the early resellers of designer yeah. handbags and every week there'd be brand new stuff you know these yeah. girls would get given gifts and then they go and trade them in 
and you know it was it it wasn't for anything like a recycling reason yeah. but it was recycling yeah well and uh, you know uh, with the levi's example they are now doing not they have uh, centers now that are not just for repair but they're also for sort of customizing your genes right so you really take pride in it and you want to sort of own it yeah. and be unique so i think that's part of the reason the vintage shops are also and these other sites are on the rise because people don't want exactly what everyone else has. They want to customize it. And mm -hmm. if you can add in the experiential piece as well, yeah. like go to a Starbucks roastery with your, new, your, your cup and learn about coffee making, right. it, that's more special than the usual, you know, go to Dunkin' Donuts, get your styrofoam cup, and leave, although they're doing yeah. away with styrofoam. But right, right. Er, brands are waking up. We are moving in the right direction. The question is, is it fast enough? And how so does look, it all play out? So, so you've written a book about it. Mm -hmm. What? Let's let, let's go through the sort of the, the first five steps a company should take. Because mm -hmm. there's companies watching this this conversation. They may have a small, a medium, a large company, and they're looking at it thinking, all right, there's so many different things there. What do I do first? Sure. How do I start this? Yeah. So what's a playbook for yeah. how they do this? Yeah, and the good news is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can just buy my book <laughs> <laughs> uh, on Amazon. But no, uh, the, as I started to allude to earlier, you start with a listening tour. Talk to your employees. Start to test drive what everyone's collective understanding might be of CSR or sustainability. Do a SWOT analysis, which doesn't have to be with McKinsey. It doesn't have to be overwrought, but so you know strengths, strengths weaknesses, weaknesses opportunities, opportunities, and threats. You'll start to identify what you've been doing all along that you can just start to package under CSR. Because that's the other thing. Yeah, it might, you might be pretty sustainable doing the right already. Thing already. Yeah, yeah. Or doing great things, whether it's volunteerism or. Uh, I was with a company once, and I, mm -hmm. I forget which one it was, and they started doing this, and they found out that half their team was already volunteering. They just didn't know about it. Yeah. So they said, wow, we can support that. And suddenly it became a huge plank in their sustainability yeah, platform. Tell the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's the brand people want to work for and be yeah. with. People, people are not monodimensional. People have lives, they have families, they have communities. Mm -hmm. And when we can start to, with integrity, do things that connect us in more than just the workplace, like a volunteer opportunity, like yeah. we did at Christie's, taking students, kids, and disadvantaged kids out to museums. Life-changing. In that effort, I'm sure there's at least one young person whose interest was sparked in art who will go on to get his or her PhD in mm -hmm. art and become an art historian yeah. and, and diversify the workplace. Yeah, I think also you're not in it on your own. At all. You know, I think the minute you you identify something that maybe your staff are doing, or that becomes you find out is important to your staff, there's almost certainly going to be a company that does that, yeah. that can help you, and you can partner with them. So clearly, you've read the caring economy because that's the next step. You you start to look at your you do your internal listening tour, do your SWOT analysis, and then start to look, for example, the UN Global Compact and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. You can it brings efficiency to the caring economy because you can see what are the cause issues and which brands are already doing stuff in that area, which organizations are doing things around environment or equality. And then you can start to not reinvent the wheel but work with those existing resources and partners and then start to scale up and then iterate. Just keep on trying on small scale, maybe not beating your chest, uh, but just keep iterating and campaigning because it's never done. On the campaign thing, I was in Davos this year at the World Economic Forum, and one of the exciting programs I heard about was LOOP, L-O-O-P, which is a recycling program that was started a few years ago in Davos with CEOs talking amongst themselves and TerraCycle, this company in New Jersey. And what it is is now being launched in New York and outside of Paris and then eventually to Japan and the rest of the world. All the great brands, P&G, uh, I shouldn't say all the great brands, great brands like P&G, Unilever, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, they are all taking on ownership of the packaging and thereby upgrading it using sort of the Airbnb model. They realize that their customers don't necessarily want the packaging, they want what's in it. Mm -hmm. So they are now saying, all right, we'll make even better packaging, we'll take on the collection of it, recycling of it, and reusing it such that all these big brands are making it easy for the consumer to to be a little bit more responsible. Yeah, you know what drives me crazy? Uh, the body shop, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, the body shop would uh, encourage you to bring your bottle back in and they'd refill it. Yeah, That's they just what they early did. on. Yeah, know, and, and when uh, the sad d uh, death of uh, Anita Roddick, the founder, all people talked about was, well, she said don't test on animals and she got proved that some of her products right. had been. And it's like, come on. This, yeah. I remember taking my little body shop bottles into the shop and getting them refilled, because mm. that's just what you did. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, you know, I think that uh, sometimes uh, le leadership is a lonely place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And sometimes maybe we're not around to, or we, leaders are not around to get the recognition. The other expression, of course, is that uh, success has many parents and failure is an orphan. <laughs> yeah, right. So I, I'm less concerned about who gets credit. Yeah. I'm more concerned about sharing and doing open source approach to these solutions because the challenges facing the planet are too great to be solved by any one brand or foundation or government. And conversely, the opportunities are well worth sharing and can only be amplified by collaboration. So I think that's great. So I wanna, I wanna close now with talking just for a moment about the future of CSR, sure. the future of sustainability. What's exciting you? And also what's concerning you? Yeah. Well, I actually am excited because I think what happens is it fades to black and goes away because it becomes so ingrained in the brand and in the employees that it's not one person's job or one department. It is so much part of the ethos of the company that it's integrated. And with that fading to black, so to speak, um, and we're seeing this real time, I believe, the, the upside of doing the right thing or being more responsible is diminishing by the day because the consumer, the investor, the customer, they expect it. We are living in the most globally connect, the most global connected creative time in history. Consumers have the information at their fingertips and they're making informed decisions and they're gonna make even more informed decisions. So the companies that don't want to confront or deal with these larger issues and find solutions to authentically and in an inspired way contribute, they're not going to be around. It's funny because that goes right back to where we started with the Parsons students that graduate not thinking about sustainability because it has to be part of what they do. It's inherent. So, Toby, this has been amazing. We're Thank now you. going to take some questions on WeChat and other platforms. So please send us your questions now. We'll do our best to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank sir. you, Simon. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Now join us online and on social media with our experts so we can answer your questions directly and keep this conversation going.